During the 1990s, MMA was nearly legislated out of existence in America. A decade later, the sport was fighting for its life in Japan. Shuken Jendai, a weekly news magazine, claimed that Pride FC had connections to Yakuza in one issue, going so far as to illustrate a shadowy figure hovering over a pride ring. Among their charges were that Pride founder Nobuyuki Sekigabara had connections with alleged organized crime figure Mr. Ishizaka, also known as Mr. I and Kim Daksu. In addition to Sakikabara, Mr. I resided in the same building as Pride head producer Kunio Kiyohara. The magazine said that Mr. I resided on the 31st floor, and Pride stars like Judo Olympian Hideheko Yoshida were seen attending soirees at the alleged criminal's home. Saki Kabara categorically denied Shuken Jendai's accusations, and Kiyohara brushed them off when confronted. But it didn't help his case that Yakuza were so frequently in the front rows of Pride events, and that rumors swirled of the bosses hanging out backstage with fighters and even having all-out brawls against the backdrop of the sporting violence Pride offered out front. In May of 2006, Shuken Jendai called on Fuji TV, the network that brought Pride into the homes of millions, to save their souls by not renewing their deal with the company that coming September. In June, Fuji and Pride cut ties. The ambitious promotion tried to proceed like nothing was wrong. They still went forward with their first show in the United States with Pride 32 in Las Vegas. It only sold a paltry 40,000 pay-per-view buys. Later, they tried to outdo their most bombastic New Year's Eve shows by contracting Mike Tyson for their card that year. But criminal charges prevented the boxer's participation. In February 2007, Pride 33, the second coming, brought the embattled company back to Vegas. It was not the final Pride show. But typical to how their fights often played out, it was like God himself was playing out a grand narrative arc with the fists and knees of the unknowing competitors. Ramu Terry Sokaju, an unknown judo competitor from Cameroon, went from massive underdog to victor in just 23 seconds by catching Antonio Rogerio Nogueira with a brutal left hook. Announcer Josh Barnett described it as a car accident. It was one of the craziest fucking things anyone had ever seen, even in Pride. And after a palate cleanser in the form of a broken down legend in Hayato Sakurai quickly dispatching American Mac Danzig, we were off to the races. Pride was about to show everyone what the world would miss if they went the way of the dodo. Shogun Hua rematched former tournament foe Alistair Overeem. While the Brazilian's last outing was a lackluster decision over tough Japanese fighter Kaz Nakamura, this time, Shogun took care of business more quickly by rolling over him on his back, taking a moment to size up his guard and completely tearing it down with a decisive Superman punch. Next was Nick Diaz and Takenori Gomi. We could do a whole 90 minute entry about both men, but I'll keep it short. Diaz was a socially maladroit triathlete who used his endless endurance to throw high volumes of punches and power his highly pedigreed ground game. He was a problem child and was just cut from the UFC for fighting his opponent in a hospital right after their match. Takenori Gomi was a mercurial standout with an iron dome and nukes for hands. By his own admission, he was starting to slack off at this point in his career. Though he suffered some lackluster wins and shocking losses, he was still a going commodity in the sport. Their fight was as bizarre as they were. Diaz tried to hit a standing Kimura on Gomi in their first round and got rocked then got back up and got the kind of fight that he actually wanted. The two men threw absolute death at each other, but it was a pace only the American could keep up. In the second round, an exhausted and hurt Gomi went to take Diaz down and landed straight in a go-go plata, a submission that was literally invented as a joke. It was the third time it had ever been successfully applied in the sport and the first by an American. Well, it was until it was overturned as a no contest. After the fight, Diaz took a urine test for marijuana metabolites. According to the Nevada State Athletic Commission, a result of 15 nanograms per milliliter was generally considered positive, but they used a more lenient standard of 50. 
just to ensure their positive tests were beyond all reasonable doubt. Diaz pissed 175. The commission chair speculated that Diaz's performance may have been enhanced by this making him literally too numb to feel pain. To digress from piss, our final fight. It was the iconic Dan Henderson, an American wrestler starring in another rematch. This one against Shogun's older brother in spirit, Vanderlei Silva. Vanderlei had already beaten Henderson once, but was unable to finish him. No one was. At this time, conventional knowledge dictated that Hendo was absolutely impossible to knock out. Though Vanderlei seemed to be a little bit shopworn by the time he was trotted out to Vegas, he still had such a resume that he was a moderate favorite against the American. Unfortunately, Henderson always outperformed when he was the dog. Henderson did his trademark gag of falling down while attempting a strike, but quickly got back up and used his wrestling to beat Vanderlei's ass for two rounds. Not in a huge, resounding way, but he was definitely winning. Vanderlei looked slow, Henderson looked comfortable, and it was probably going to be a victory for Decision Dan, as Henderson was called by forum users at the time. Well, he must have gotten sick of that nickname, because in the third round, Henderson hit Vanderlei with a fucking spinning back fist and then completely shut his lights off with a left hook. Henderson was the pride middleweight champion. Vanderlei looked like he was dead. Diaz was leaking like a faucet, but he was so astronomically stoned that he might not have cared. Shogun was smiling pleasantly somewhere. And everyone got to see why Pride was so cool, even if the uptight American Athletic Commission didn't let them bring over their soccer kicks from Japan. Just one month later, Dreamstage Entertainment announced that Zufa, the UFC's parent company, would buy Pride's assets. This would be how Pride lived. Its best fighters would compete against the UFC's best, while the pomp and circumstance of their biggest shows would go on. Five months later, the UFC declared that they just couldn't bring Pride back to Japan. They alluded to vague problems with fighter contracts and how weirdly they were written at times, how hard it was for them to get anything done over there, and unstated, but just as important, how Pride just wasn't the UFC brand. Two months after that, Pride's offices in Japan closed. The UFC had just spent $65 million on a tape library and whatever contracts weren't too weird for them to renegotiate. The recession of 2008 permanently engendered cynicism in millions. While that November, unprecedented numbers of young people came out to vote for Barack Obama, most people's lives remained pretty shitty. None of the scumbag bankers went to jail. Most of the jobs created in the vaunted recovery thereafter were temporary positions, and the pain of seeing a system completely fail never leaves some people. It's not really part of our national discourse, but a lot of people completely checked out in 2008 and in the following years. It's not just Donald Trump's much-touted forgotten man. It's the fucked-up 19-year-old who hates himself because he doesn't feel like he's good at anything. He feels like he'll never get the chance to grow up. And sees his parents who have to work until they die because they got wiped out by the market and decides that he's right to give up. It's the 26-year-old who did five unpaid internships in the last four years, finally gets a permanent position, and gets sexually harassed by some mid-level executive but knows that HR exists to protect the company. And she has no savings anyway. So what is she going to do? It's the guy who got so mad after 9-11 that he joined the army and got to kill all the people that he said he would. And it just made him crazy enough to scare off everyone in his life every time he hears anything loud. 2008 didn't bring the pitchforks. It didn't scare any CEOs or private equity managers. It just made everyone too fucking beaten down for anyone who deserves it to ever see the inside of a cell. But people who have been flattened by the earth still live, even if they feel they don't fit in anywhere. And of course, 
one place was tailor-made in our culture for people that did not fit. As part of the nation pinned their hopes on Obama to make institutions trustworthy and functional, another part pinned their hopes to nativism and racial terror as a means to reclaim the halls of power. But amid all this, the UFC just remained their glittery, tacky selves. And holy shit, did it pay off. This was the perfect time for Brock Lesnar. Lesnar was America's largest son. A big, wet, pissed-off Great Plains genetic freak who made his name in the WWE and came to the UFC to piss off every hardcore fan then make them throw their hats on the ground like Yosemite Sam when he actually won a UFC heavyweight title in 2008. Even though he beat Randy Couture, who was 45 years old and much smaller than Lesnar, it was an incredible accomplishment considering it was the pro wrestler's fourth ever MMA fight, and he had just been knee barred by Frank Mir nine months prior. Two thousand nine's UFC 100 was a celebration of every stupid thing about the promotion that was nearly snuffed out in its cradle, and it was like a coronation for Lesnar as the king of all pissed off men in America. But pretty much the entire card was great. In the third fight of the pay-per-view, Dan Henderson landed what is probably the most iconic knockout ever in MMA, when he seemingly murdered Michael Bisping. Next, 170-pound champion George St. Pierre completely shut down Brazilian Muay Thai specialist Thiago Alves in one of his more exciting to watch long-distance fights. And in the main event, Brock Lesnar rematched Frank Mir, who said a bunch of utterly confounding things pre-fight and was ultimately shut up by 15 consecutive right-hand strikes. This, when coupled with the post-fight shit talk, further established the former pro wrestler as the UFC's greatest heel. UFC 100 was the biggest event the company had ever done at that point, clocking in 1.6 million pay-per-view buys, which is even more incredible when you realize that the gross domestic product of the United States was still contracting at this time. But then again, there's maybe nothing that strange about getting all those people to pay $50 to get all pissed off with their boy with that going on in the backdrop. It wasn't just Brock, though. It seemed like around 2009, the UFC had picked up pride's luck when it came to dramatic storylines in their fights. Previous rivalries in the UFC were things like the marble mouth Tito Ortiz shouting gibberish at the usually mum Chuck Liddell in between beatings at Liddell's hands. But things were different now. Let's take a look at Liddell's old kingdom of light heavyweight at this time. Shogun Hua shows up at the UFC fat and unprepared due to a knee injury. Shocks everyone by losing to ultimate fighter guy Forrest Griffin, who shocks everyone again by beating Rampage Jackson for the belt. Griffin loses to another Ultimate Fighter winner everyone assumed was bad in Rashad Evans, who then gets completely outclassed by Lyoto Machida, a Brazilian karate champion whose style was so unusual that Joe Rogan literally declared, welcome to the Machida era when he won. Meanwhile, Shogun strings together some lackluster looking wins and shows up to their title fight with everyone bracing themselves to see their pride favorite get knocked out when he actually goes all five rounds and wins on everyone's scorecards but the judges. Gets a rematch. And takes a decision out of the judges' hands this time, decapitating Machida in one of the most cathartic knockouts in UFC history. There was no greater storyline than Shell Sonnen and Anderson Silva. Like all great fights, this one had some special context. Anderson Silva was seen as the best ever. After nearly quitting during his days of pride due to two submission losses, Anderson became patient, a master of timing who knew how to keep his cool, keep his distance, and make you look like a fucking asshole for even trying when the moment came. Part of that was Antonio Rodrigo Nogueira befriending him and showing up holes in his game, but it was also Silva maturing as a competitor and as a man. 
When he came to the UFC in 2006, he destroyed the iron shin Chris Lieben in under a minute and was immediately granted a title shot. He carved up middleweight champ Rich Franklin and never looked back. Going into the UFC 112, Anderson had defended his belt five times and ended up vacationing outside middleweight so he could take down a journeyman and former champ in his spare time. One Twelve was the UFC's first event in the Middle East, a token for Abu Dhabi's live events company Flash Entertainment buying a stake in Zufa. This was largely thanks to Sheikh Tanun bin Zayed, a member of Abu Dhabi's ruling family who is a huge MMA enthusiast. Years later, Flash Entertainment would divest itself of its partial ownership in Zufa, but not before Sheikh Tanun assumed the role of UAE's national security advisor. He was reportedly a key figure in the Emirates' involvement in the Yemeni civil war, which has drawn numerous allegations of war crimes. UFC 112 was held on Yas Island, where immigrant workers have allegedly been subject to forced labor and unacceptable living conditions. A special stadium had been built specifically for this event, in which the greatest fighter in the world was expected to deliver yet another spectacular performance. Instead, the 185-pound king danced, taunted, and mostly played with his food, utterly disgracing the special stadium that the Emiratis had so nicely made for him. Dana White and the fans were pissed. Dana even said that he would cut Anderson if he ever fought like that again. Before 112, Anderson was rumored to be up against George St. Pierre in a big money super fight. But after earning the ire of fans and management alike, he was given a hard fight without the same payday. He was given Shell Sonnen. Unlike Anderson's previous diet of humble Midwesterners and deferential Brazilians who feared his aura, Shell Sonnen's whole act was that he didn't give a shit. He promised to get in there and bust Anderson's ass. But during the lead up to this fight, there was another reigning master of the universe who had worn thin on guys who wear Fox Racing branded clothing as well. As always, I am speaking of Barack Obama. Obama impressed a lot of people during his rise, what with dispatching entrenched barnacles of his own party before cruising to a wide victory. While his idealism and commitment to national unity helped him win the title, once those qualities failed to manifest his real change, many who had bought into his promises grew disillusioned with him. But there was another group of people who could not ever be appealed to. In 2010, the nativist response to a black president in the form of the Tea Party was sweeping the nation. Like all authoritarians, they demanded a return to how things were in a different, fictional time, and tried to find every way that they could to say that Obama was illegitimate. Chell Sonnen played a similar tune. Anderson was not champion. I think a black belt under the Noguera brothers is saying I like I got a free toy in my Happy Meal. Anderson was a feat. I'm going to put him on his prissy little ass. Anderson was a big old foreign dipshit who was about to face a real American wrestler. It's a step harder picking up that language than it is understanding pig Latin. Chell's barbs were more rooted in pro wrestling routine and fight promotion than they were in white revanchism. But like the Tea Party, it was seen as part entertaining sideshow, part insane bullshit, part of fun diversion to the stale reign of an unbeatable force that would eventually get its just desserts. Sonnen even had the personal weirdness of those old Tea Party candidates. He was a real estate agent who quit a state house race in Oregon because of later discovered sketchy business practices. After months of talking shit, Chael Sonnen and Anderson Silva entered the cage at UFC 117 in Oakland, California. Before their match, Anderson had brought in Steven Seagal to train him as an elaborate joke showing how little he gave a shit. At the pre-fight presser, he didn't even look at Sonnen. He was going back to the old spider, right? Just go into bullet time and lay this guy out. In little over a minute into round one, Shell did what no man in the UFC had done to that point and rocked Anderson Silva. To this day, people still debate whether Anderson was actually dropped or if Chell just pounced on him once his knees buckled. But his ass hit the ground one way or the other. The pressure fighter stayed heavy on top of Anderson, cleaning his clock with punches, smothering his mouth, and just generally making the greatest look like another guy who couldn't figure out a wrestler.
Then he did it again. And again. For four rounds, Chael absolutely tooled Anderson all over the place, and he did exactly what he said he would do. I'm gonna put him on his prissy little ass. Long derided is just another boring wrestler. He actually showed some flair. At one point, taking Anderson down from his own guard. Not sweeping him with some fancy jiu-jitsu, just picking up Anderson's legs while flat on his fucking back and dumping him on his ass as he was all night. Going into round five, Anderson's corner was just short of tears, pleading with their fighter to retain his honor by at least avoiding the takedown this time. Was this how it ended? It always was. The unbeatable don't go out in flashes. They get dismantled anticlimactically, losing lopsided decisions or getting finished late, proving that the cruel randomness of the sport is never flukes. But how much changes, and how quickly. How it can be a fucking journeyman with 10 losses who just figures out a couple new things that confound someone you thought was Bruce Lee. For half that final round, that's what everyone was thinking. Then Anderson did something atypical. He threw out a technique, not with lightning quick execution and smoothness, but sloppy, clearly using the last bits left in him. He willed a grappling technique, a triangle choke into existence. Shell was going to get out of this. We're all going to get our hearts broken. No fucking point in even investing in this one. Except Shell didn't. He just fell tighter and tighter into it. At three minutes and 10 seconds, Anderson used the loose triangle setup to take Chell's arm. And Chell quit. Three months after UFC 117, Republicans riding the Tea Party wave utterly demolished the Obama coalition. They picked up 63 seats in the House, six in the Senate, 680 seats in state legislatures, and six governorships. Nothing on paper, like Obama's margins two years before or bad national polling for GOP policies mattered. In the real world, there were no astounding outcomes. Barack Obama and the Democrats couldn't do the unthinkable. They were no more able to accomplish tangible things like universal health care than they were their lofty bullshit goals like healing social fracture in a crumbling empire. The Tea Party psychos who stormed into the House were no more able themselves. They couldn't accomplish their tangible goal of repealing Obamacare, nor could they make it so Obama wasn't black and wasn't their president. There's no magic out there when it comes to the contests over resources that determine the courses of our lives and the lives of our children. We just relive our cycles, hoping that we can be good enough to make it out of this one. With all the cheap fake money from the finance world and all the resentment that bubbles in the twilight of an empire, drawing our backs to our Promethean punishment. We hope that so many of us aren't beaten down by circumstance that they can remain in the fight. And we hope those that are can at least have some slightly less monstrous healthcare system or something that allows them to escape even just for a few hours on a Saturday night. The magic is elsewhere. The magic that we wish we saw everywhere else was in the cage, because it was conjured by people who were just too fucked up to make it in the dull, constantly disappointing world outside. In a world where everything seemed to get slightly better than slightly worse at a more constant rate, at least there was one place where unthinkable things actually happened. At least if you put two weird people with incredible abilities in front of each other, their combined experiences and opposing martial abilities would create a beautiful, maddening story. How did we fuck that up? Up next, the end of history. <laughs> 